So this is going to be more of an advanced guide for defenses in Titan Quest. It's updated for Ragnarok. And I'm going to do it mostly in a podcasty sort of way, so if you just want to listen to something in the background you're, while you play, you're good to go. If you want to watch something on screen, I'm also going to include some interesting items and things to support talking points. So you're good to go there as well. So let's jump right into it. Pretty much everything I have to say about defense in Titan Quest revolves around the damage order. After talking about the damage order, I'm going to talk a little bit about some extra dangers you might encounter while playing Titan Quest, and also some extra mechanical things that are things you can use your hands with the, the mouse and keyboard to improve your mechanical play and increase your odds of survival. But the bulk of this video is going to be about the damage order, so I've got it on screen. What is the damage order? Well, you can see life there at the bottom. So this is an itemized list, and it's in order. So if an attack hits you, it has to go through this entire list step by step before it reaches your life. So the list in order goes like this. First is percent chance to dodge and percent chance to avoid projectiles. Next is the offensive ability versus defensive ability equation. After that is percent less damage from creature type and armor. I wasn't sure in my own testing which one comes first. It has very little impact and only for melee attacks, I'm sorry, physical attacks. Uh, so I figured it doesn't really matter. And again, without data mining, it's very difficult to test that. Afterwards is resists, and then percent damage absorption. That's not to be confused with percent armor absorption. After that is flat absorb, shield, and then of course your life. So first on the list is percent chance to dodge, which affects melee attacks and percent chance to avoid projectiles, which of course helps you avoid projectiles. Sometimes that's also called deflection. You'll notice if you read the Anniversary Edition patch notes that they gave enemy constructs and devices a deflection chance, for instance. Both of these effects work similarly. They're a percent chance to completely negate that type of damage. They stack up to 80% and they add together. The bonuses from your masteries and your gear, they add together. Now in Anniversary Edition, you used to be able to stack these to 100%, so classically a Haru Specs, which is Dream Hunter, they would stack defensive ability along with chance to avoid projectiles to become pretty much immune to attacks. You can't do that anymore, and stacking up to even 80% requires a lot of investment, opportunity cost, and is usually only feasible by certain masteries like Haru Specs. Of the two, I would say deflection is the more important one. And that's because unlike in Grim Dawn, ranged attacks are not affected by defensive ability, nor are they affected by offensive ability. So you can't crit with them, but you can't hit with them either, and that counts for monsters as well. That means the ranged attacks you'll be facing off against won't be spiky, but they'll be consistent. And it just so happens in Titan Quest, it's very high. You'll notice if you've been to Act 4, Mackay archers, in particular Grandmaster Mackay archers, they just do a ton of damage. And melee attacks are affected by defensive ability, which means you can... We'll talk about defensive ability next, but in short, you can reduce the damage greatly there. There's no tool like that for ranged weapons. There's very few defensive capabilities you have to mitigate ranged damage. So if you have to pick between the two, I would go with chance to avoid projectiles. But really, if you have any of this stuff, either of them, in your mastery, get it. So that's dodge attack for warfare, temporal flux for dream, find cover for hunter, that sort of thing. Get them, cap them, plus for them, all that stuff. So let's assume that you neither dodge the melee attack or avoid the projectile. After that, you go into step two on the damage order, which is offensive ability versus defensive ability. And just like last time, this doesn't affect every single damage type. OA versus DA is only something that's compared for melee attacks. So it does not affect spells, and it does not affect the, the ranged game whatsoever. So this is really just assuming you didn't dodge the attack from step one. So just to restate, unlike other games like Grim Dawn, defensive ability in Titan Quest cannot affect missiles or spells, but it's still important. In fact, it's so good that DA needed a nerf in Anniversary Edition. Like I said before, I talked about the Immortal Haru specs. They would stack something like 2,000 or 2,500 defensive ability, which is ludicrous. And they would get that by stacking a special affix called Percent DA. It was just a percentage scaler for your defensive ability. 
Well, they kind of got rid of that affix. It's still around, but in a lot of places where that appeared before, it's no longer the case. It's much easier to stack flat, especially in the early game, if you look at something like wood lore from the hunting tree. Ever since Anniversary Edition, that's given flat defensive ability, which is actually extremely overpowered in the early game. In fact, it's one of the best defensive tools for Act 1 normal available to any character. But once you get towards the end of the game, the scaling falls off. It used to be better when it was a percentage ability, uh, wood lore, that is in that you can stack a bunch of flat DA on your gear and through dexterity and then scale it with these enormous multipliers. So another way that Anniversary Edition nerfed defensive ability was they granted it diminishing returns when it eclipses your enemy's offensive ability. So the way this formula works is it compares your DA versus your enemy's OA offensive ability if they're hitting you. If your DA is greater, then there will be a greater chance that that'll be, I guess you could consider it a glancing blow. It'll deal less damage. Likewise, if their offensive ability starts to eclipse your defensive ability, they can crit you. And that's what you want to avoid. You want to avoid that at all costs. The best benchmark for that is right when you get to Act 4. Are the frogmen critting you? Are the crabs critting you? Um, are the lamias and those sort of things critting you? If you're getting crit at the start of Act 4, you just don't have enough defensive ability, and you're going to have a miserable time for the rest of the game. So you really want to shore up once you get there. Babylon is another decent benchmark for that. There's kind of an exception to this rule. With Ragnarok, they introduced a lot of questionable gear. I don't exactly know what they were thinking, but uh, if you look at something like Freya's chess piece, it's a legendary chess piece, or I believe it's called the Blood Lotus, throwing weapon. I could have that wrong, but I'll put it on screen. That throwing weapon gives 50% defensive ability, which is enormous. That's an extremely high scalar, especially considering that things like wood lore and the defensive variant from Defense Mastery, that those are so high and flat nowadays. And Freya's chess piece is even more egregious. It's like 100% DA. That's just, that's ridiculous. I don't know what else to say about it. So I guess there are exceptions to that design philosophy. They had an anniversary edition. They did reintroduce items in Ragnarok that you can use to tunnel your defensive ability. But I think they're banking on that diminishing returns coming into play and making it not so overpowered. So again, that is if your DA is severely, severely uh, overcapped in terms of your enemy's offensive ability, there's a huge gap there, then you'll see less and less of that reduced damage from their melee attacks come into play. Another great way to aid in your own defense with this part of the damage order is to reduce your enemy's offensive ability. There's quite a few uh, skills that do this. I know Energy Drain, if you're playing Rune Master, that does it. Reduces enemy OA by 20%. So you can use that in conjunction with a decent enough defensive ability in order to make sure you're not getting crit at all. And I really think that's the way to go for most characters, is to not try to get it so that way melee attacks do less and less damage but just get it to where you're not getting critically hit. That's good enough for defensive ability nowadays. Some characters like Haru Specs can still tunnel. Some characters who use hide decks for maybe scaling the new staff damage types or maybe the new Ichthian Stinger Bow. If you're scaling decks for damage, you can use something like, I don't know, one of those overpowered throwing weapons in your offhand or something like that that scales DA. But for the most part, you're just looking to not get crit. So you're going to want to do that with a combination of dexterity and gear. Most characters try to aim for a certain amount of dexterity. That dexterity is whatever is required to equip Stonebinder's Cuffs. So if you don't know Stonebinder's Cuffs, you can look them up on the database. I'll also have them on screen. But basically, they have a dexterity requirement. It's an awesome sort of item to fit in your arm slot. So by normal mode, uh, let's just say the Minotaur, you're going to want... 128 decks or whatever is required to equip the normal version. By the time you reach Epic Minotaur, you're going to want 308 or whatever that requirement is. And if, by the way, they have increased the requirement for Stonebinders. It was a slight nerf to them. So just keep that in mind. You might want to reevaluate whether your character should even go for the benchmark for legendary Stonebinders cuffs. It's really up to you. But I think the legendary are something like 423, something like that, to equip. So those are your benchmarks in terms of dexterity. Of course, every point in dexterity is going to give you one point in defensive ability. 
the rest of your defensive ability is going to come through just through gear bonuses. So practically speaking, if you're falling short and you're getting crit, you don't want to fix that problem by just tunneling into dexterity. Stats in this game are extremely important. Instead, you just want to look for rings, in particular swap rings for elements that you might use. We'll go over that when we talk about resists. But try to find your prefix, which is of course the resist, and then have a suffix that gives defensive ability. Or maybe try to find a, a nice suffix for a chest piece or something like that, just to help you out a little bit. In general, by the time you reach Babylon, you might have something like 200 defensive ability. That is Babylon normal. Somewhere in the middle of epic mode, you'll have 500-ish. And by the end game, you'll want about 1,000. And that'll keep you from getting crit by most enemies most of the time. Now, that's not always true. Some enemies have ways to reduce your defensive ability, just like you can theirs. So if you look at the entrapment skill from Hunting Mastery, even just one rank in that will reduce defensive ability by 300. And of course, enemies can use that against you. That's probably the most common way your DA is going to be reduced is from that ability. So if you get trapped, that could be very bad. So of course reduced entrapment duration helps out because that debuff only lasts as long as the trap does. But it's not just traps. So when it comes to fighting certain bosses like the Wraith Lord in Act 2, he's got a special ability. You wouldn't know it until you've tested it, but it does lower your defensive ability and it lowers it substantially. He has his adds out, he reduces your defensive ability, then himself and all of his adds are wailing on you. And each one's going to be a crit, so that, you know, he could follow up with that debuff. It's more dangerous out in the field when you potentially have a lot more enemies on you, but it's also dangerous against bosses too, so just keep that in mind. So third on the list is percent less damage from creatures and armor. Again, I'm not sure which one comes first, but let's talk about percent less damage from creatures. Most notably, I'd say Oedipus Armor, which reduces demon damage by 50%, and Shadow Wall, which is a shield, and it reduces demon damage by 60%. Now both of these are strength items, but you can see just how enormous that bonus is. That's something very unique to Titan Quest. It was made kind of in an age, this post Diablo 2 era, where there wasn't too many ARPGs on the market. Your POEs and your Diablo 3s and stuff like that did not exist. Of course, Grim Dawn didn't exist either. So this was sort of untreaded territory. And I guess they figured since it was just one monster type that it was fine, but it turns out these two items in particular are enormously overpowered. Now both of them are strength items, so not everyone can use them, but if you happen to be playing a Conqueror or something like that, and you get one of these items before Act 4, you're just going to completely be able to skip Act 4. And by the way, Act 4 is definitely the hardest act in the game, even considering Ragnarok because it's mostly filled with demons and the demons do a lot of damage. So if you can reduce demon damage by 50 or 60%, you're just gonna walk straight through that, that act. In fact, these items are so good that you can feasibly use them in Act 4 Epic Mode to counter them completely as well. So being able to use one item to completely counter the hardest part of the game, turns out that's a bit overpowered. And these artifacts still kind of exist. They're relics of the past, but when they went to do another pass with Titan Quest Ragnarok, they didn't go back and nerf these. Instead, what they did is the items they introduced with these effects are much more tame. They're like 10, 20% for the most part. But these still exist. Now, there's more than just these two, of course. Uh, I should also mention Boar Hunter's Shield. Give that one a shout out. It reduces damage from beasts by quite a bit. And that's important because one of the hardest uh, bosses in the game is Cerberus later on. And he's, of course, a beast. Now, these bonuses do add together. So if you have a Boar Hunter shield and you have uh, gloves of the glade, then they will stack together, but they do cap at 80%. I believe that was an anniversary edition change, so you can't get total immunity from demons or bosses, but you can get close. So there's some relics and charms that also aid in these sort of stats, and I'll put them on screen in case you're like a intellect user, you just don't have Shadow Wall or Oedipus as, a, as an option, which you probably won't. I'll just name some of them off in case you're listening. One of them is Tortured Soul. It drops off of those Mass Effect looking dudes, the, what are they, the Hanar? Yeah, they drop Tortured Soul. And there's a completion bonus for Tortured Soul that allows you to reduce damage from demons, so that's an option. Unfortunately, it goes in the ring and amulet slot, and that's already a contended slot because of Dionysus wineskin. 
but it's an option for you. If you want to reduce damage from Dragonkin in Act 3, if you have trouble with them, uh, there's a new charm in Act 5. I don't know how to pronounce it, Serenuos or something. I'll put it on screen. But the it's not a completion bonus. It's just that's straight up what the, what the Relic does. Of course, it's towards the top of the damage order. So it's before things like Flat Absorb, Shield, and even Resists. At the very least, they're amazing swap items. And now we come to armor rating. Now this is the first one that's really weird just in the way it works mechanically. So if you're a veteran and you're listening to this, and especially if you also play Grim Dawn, you might glean something here because the way it works in Titan Quest is the same way it works in Grim Dawn. It's just that the numbers are different. So you probably know that when you take any piece of physical damage, and that could be melee, ranged, or from a spell, like the physical damage component of Eruption, there's a 40% chance that attack will hit your torso, and there's a 20% chance it'll hit your helmet, your boots, and your arm slot. But what makes it strange is the way that the absorption is applied. And it's probably not the way you think. So we can't talk about armor rating without first talking about armor absorption. So that's a concept again in both games, Grim Dawn and Titan Quest. In Grim Dawn, the base armor absorption is 70%, and you can increase it from there. And in Titan Quest, the base is 66%. And your armor absorption is the amount of physical damage that any of your body parts can negate, but is applied in a not-so-simple way. So suppose it's your torso that gets hit, and let's assume that your torso has an armor rating of 300, and your armor absorption is 66%, which is just the base. That means you'll absorb 66% of the first 300 physical damage you receive in an attack, and the rest is taken in full. So let's go through a couple of examples, and that should highlight what exactly this difference means in terms of your play and how you should think about armor. And also remember, before we get into these examples, that we're number three in the damage order. We haven't yet got to physical resist, and we haven't yet got to percent absorption, percent damage absorption, which is a pretty common stat and very powerful. So because of that, armor is a little bit less potent than it could be, just keep that in mind. So in the first example, and again we're reusing the 300 armor on your torso and the 66% damage absorption, let's say you get hit by 500 physical damage. So at this point in the damage order, you're up against 500 physical damage. So you're going to mitigate 66% of the first 300, since you have 300 armor, which is going to equal 102 damage taken. So of the first 300 damage, you took 102 of it because of your armor absorption. The remaining 200 damage is going to be taken in full. So the grand total of your damage there is going to be 302. Now in the second example, let's assume you get hit by a much chunkier hit. It's 3,000 physical damage. So that could be a boss, Hydra, maybe in step two of the damage order where we compared offensive ability to defensive ability. You were lacking in DA and you got crit. So at this point, it's 3,000 physical damage that you're up against. So again, the first 300 damage, we mitigate 66% of it because of our absorption, which again is 102 out of the first 300 damage. The remaining 2,700 we take in full. So the total damage we, we take from the second hit is 2,802 damage. So you'll note right away that we mitigated a much larger fraction of the overall damage in the first example. 302 out of 500 instead of 2,802 out of 3,000. So if we can draw a conclusion from these examples, it's this. Since any physical damage over your armor rating is not affected by armor absorption, armor is best at mitigating small to moderate physical damage. That's how it works practically. My opinion on what you should do is you should only invest in armor in sort of an all-in sort of way. You treat it much like shields. So of course you wouldn't invest in shield block if you don't have a lot of recovery. And you wouldn't invest in recovery or a block if your shield couldn't absorb a lot of damage in the first place. You increase them all together. I would treat armor in the same way. So either you get both high armor on all of your pieces, in addition to scaling your armor absorption to make that higher, or you don't worry about either of them in particular. That doesn't mean you ignore armor. It just means that if you really want to make use out of armor as a defensive mechanic, one, you should be a strength-based character, so that way you can equip any of the strength items that grant armor. By the way, strength armor tends to be much better than int or dex armor, much, much higher armor. 
and you should have some means of increasing your base armor absorption. Now that comes most commonly through the defense mastery, but it also happens in some pieces of gear. So just by the way, the most ideal class to take advantage of armor defensively would be a combination of defense mastery and earth mastery. And that's because defense mastery has rally and it has battle awareness, which both grant flat armor. And Earth Mastery has something that grants flat armor as well. I can't remember the name of it offhand. Tempering, maybe. But it's the thing that gives you uh, fire resistance and flat armor. Now that flat armor is applied blanketly across all of your pieces of gear. It's not applied to anyone in particular. And by the way, that's the same way rings work and amulets. If you find armor on a ring or amulet, they apply to every single one of your pieces of armor in full. If you get armor added to any piece of gear that already has armor, like a chest piece or a helmet or whatever, it only applies to that piece of gear. It doesn't apply to all of your armor. So if you find a local bonus for armor on a piece of gear that already provides armor, it's only going to apply to that piece of gear. But rings, amulets, and mastery skills, they all provide their armor bonuses in full to everything. So because of that, the armor potential for a strength scaling earth slash defense character is the highest in armor rating, but also the armor absorption scaling is the highest in potential too, because uh, of course defense mastery I think is the only mastery that provides scaling to your base armor absorption, and you can get the rest through items. For every other character, if you don't want to go with, the, with that all-in approach, I would highly recommend just making sure your armor is relatively up to date and leave it at that. You know, make sure especially your torso is up to date. Like I said, every piece of gear has a chance to be hit individually. So if your arm piece is very low in armor because you've been relying on some crazy affix and you don't want to get rid of it, take an extra consideration there because that could get you killed. So a couple other factoids about armor. First, armor absorption is capped at 100%. Same thing in Grim Dawn. So you can't increase your base armor absorption over 100%. And any modifiers to armor absorption apply multiplicatively with the base, which is worse than applying additively, or in other words, absolutely, because if you get a 10% armor absorption bonus somewhere, let's just say in your defense mastery, you're going to go from 66% to 72.6%. You're not going to go from 66% to 76%. So just something to keep in mind. And again, armor only affects physical damage. It does not affect pierce. Pierce bypasses armor and is affected by pierce resistance. And armor does not affect bleed and, of course, the elements. And just to answer a question you might have, is it better to increase your armor absorption or your physical resistance? That's a pretty easy answer. It's just your physical resistance. And that's because your physical resistance always works for you for the entirety of the physical damage you take, whereas your armor absorption only works for the part up to your armor rating. And also, your armor absorption bonuses apply multiplicatively, whereas your physical resistance bonuses add together. So again, it works, all of these things work the same way in Grim Dawn, the same as they work in Titan Quest. The numbers are a little bit different, but it's probably not the way you'd assume it works. I know when I first saw armor, I treated it like an MMORPG. I thought all the armor from all the slots added together, and that's the, what you would mitigate off of each attack, but that's that's not the case. So now we come to resists, number four on the damage order. This is probably the best thing to discuss because this is something you can take to pretty much any ARPG. A lot of other RPGs, not just action RPGs, utilize resists, and it's a really a staple of how you mitigate damage in any game. The overall philosophy resists is always that you want to cap them at all times, but in Titan Quest it's much harder to do that than in Grim Dawn, or in pretty much any other ARPG I've played personally. And that's because there's no devotion system to shore up on your weaknesses, there's fewer gear slots, and you can't enchant all the pieces of your armor. You can only enchant green and yellow items, or monster and frequents. You cannot enchant epics or legendaries. And the itemization is such that sometimes items will have ridiculous amounts of resists. Like I just found a chest on my Hunter's playthrough, my Dragon Hunter, it's called Skin of the Magi or something like that, Robe of the Magi. It gives like 300% resistances. Sometimes you'll find something that has just nothing. It's got just energy and offensive scaling, stuff like that. It's no good. So the way you want to get around the fact that Titan Quest is so harsh on your resistances 
is to be strategic and to carry a lot of swap gear. Now for this guide, I'm going to assume that you're not inheriting anything. You don't have a bank full of charms or a TQ vault that can just help you out at any point. You're a brand new character. It's your first time playing through. And you just have to work with what you find or with what you shop with at the vendor. The best thing you can do for your resists is to carry swap rings. Now rings, they only take up one square on your inventory. That's just one little square. You can carry like six swap rings, and that's just as bad as having a swap chest. It's even better because you can move them around and make room in your inventory if you're full. But anyway, what you want to do is in this game, items can have one prefix and one suffix. So what you're looking for in the early game is the insulating prefix on a ring either in a vendor or on the floor, so just make sure your eyes are getting used to insulating. And that's going to provide some sort of resistance, either lightning or fire or cold. And your suffix, you want it to be of survival, which gives health, or the DA suffix, I don't remember what it is, look at me, so unprepared. But either of those two, HP or DA in a suffix, is good enough. And of course, you want a swap ring for every single element. So ideally, in the early game, you'll have a swap ring for fire, which gives fire and like, let's say health. You'll have one for cold and you'll have one for lightning. And ideally, ideally, you'll have two sets of those swap rings for six in total. The reason being is you want to enchant the first set with demon's blood and you want to enchant the second set with Dionysus wineskin. That's a little bit metagame. I mean, if you really want to be good on a deathless playthrough, you would absolutely do that. I mean, absolutely do that. But just starting out, Make sure that you're picking up rings off the ground that have insulated. Check and see if the suffix is good. Every time you go to a vendor, just hover over the rings real quick and always keep the best, most up-to-date swap ring for each element in your inventory. Another piece of swap gear you can carry around is your chest piece. I personally like to have pierced chest pieces, for the most part, equipped at all times. And then I'll swap to a bleed or a poison chest piece. And by the way, I'm someone who likes to equip mostly green, monster infrequent and yellow items. I tend to not use a lot of epics and legendaries unless they're ridiculously overpowered. And that's just because I like to tailor my defenses so specifically using enchants that it just, even if the epics and legendaries are better in terms of armor or certain stats, I really, really only care about very specific things, but that's just me personally. So much like we talked about Demon's Blood and Dionysus Wineskin for rings, you also want to keep an eye out for good enchanting things for your armor. My favorite is Ajax. It's a relic that grants slow resist, stun resist, and 6% health. But that's just because I really hate being slowed in these games, and I really like the tertiary stats like stun res. So Ajax is usually my go-to for attack-based characters. But if you're really hurting on pierce or bleed or poison, you can have a pristine plumage, which gets poison res. You can have a hag skin which, with a nice completion bonus. Hag skin on its own is really bad. You really rely on a good completion bonus for pierce res. That can allow you to double up on pierce. A boar's hide is good for bleed. You can get a bleed completion bonus or a pierce completion bonus if you want to be a little bit balanced. And also worth noting on the gear swap thing is annulling amulets. So annulling is a prefix for amulets only that provides all elemental resistances and you can start finding them as early as act two at the vendors and on the ground just keep an eye out for them they're very good in the early game that affix does upgrade later on i think by epic mode you start seeing like 23 percent elemental res in a certain prefix it's not called annulling anymore at that point it's something else uh, and you can look up all these prefixes and what they're called so you know what to look for by the way on the titan quest database it's just a website you can Google TQDB, that'll get you there. So a couple of quick facts about resists in this game. Keep in mind that your resist can be reduced, like in other games, and it's by the same abilities that you would use to reduce enemy resists, like Flush Out and Death Chill Aura, stuff like that, Squall. Another thing is that all resists in Anniversary Edition, except for physical resist, now get reduced in every difficulty. That includes Bleed Res and Vitality Res. Those didn't used to get reduced before, so... That makes it even harder to get resists, unfortunately, and makes it, uh, I believe, more, more good, more better to, uh, to include swap chest pieces and swap rings into your, your stuff. And by the way, you lose 40% all res, except for Fizz, when you go into Epic, and you lose 60%. Ugh, you lose 60% when you get into Legendary. 
for a grand total of minus 100% and legendary. So those are additive. Also resist stack, of course. They stack additively, and they cap at 80%, just like any other game out there. Unlike PoE and Grim Dawn, you can't, at least I haven't found a way to increase your max resistances, so 80% is the highest you go. Resists, of course, they reduce that damage type by the listed percent, so if you have 80% uh, poison resistance, at this point in the damage order, you'd multiply that poison damage by 0.2 if you had an 80% resistance towards it. Usually in these games, by the way, damage is balanced around you having high or max resists, so you really, really can't afford to be like negative and pierce and then enter Act 4. You're going to get massacred. You cannot walk into Cerberus' room and just be like, oh, 20% res, I'm in the positives, I'm fine. You're going to get eaten alive, dude, you're dead. So it's really, really important to have maximum resists, 80%. And just to contextualize that statement, you might think in other games that going from 80 to 85% resistance is pretty lackluster. But considering that damage is balanced around 80% resistance, if you go from 80 to 85 you're in actuality taking 25% less damage from that element than you would be taking otherwise at 80. So that difference sounds a lot better, right? So when you realize that damage is balanced around this level, you start to know that if you're dying a lot and your resists are low, that's primarily the reason why. No other thing on this entire damage order, except for maybe percent absorb, is going to help you so much as increasing your resistances. So we'll go through quickly what resistances you're looking for each act. Again, this is more applicable to the campaign walkthrough, but for Act 1, Poison, Vitality. Act 2, Poison and Fire. Act 3, All Elemental Resists and Vitality. Act 4, Poison, Vitality and an extra consideration towards Pierce. And Act 5, you're going to want Cold and Bleed, and later on Vitality and Fire included as well. And for every single act, you're going to want physical and pierce. Physical is by far the best resistance in this game. Physical damage is absurd. If you find someone who's hitting you with a spear and you're like, oh, that's probably pierce damage, it's mostly physical damage. I mean, just look at a spear. Most of the time they have a 25% pierce ratio, so only 25% of that damage is pierce. Now, of course, enemies get flat damage buffs in this game. I believe that flat damage buff is actually physical, by the way. And that would be modified by the pierce ratio, but it's still doing the bulk of its damage in fizz. And lastly, we're going to do a couple special shoutouts to resist the secondary resist in this game. The most important being stun, freeze, and trap, and slow uh, can be mitigated. Of course, if you're a defense mastery, you have that really nice iron will, or whatever it's called. Make sure you read through iron will. It doesn't affect every single tertiary out there, and there are more... I'm sorry, secondary. I always used to call it tertiaries, but they're secondaries now. There are more secondary effects than just stun, freeze, and trap, and slow. I believe paralyzes his own effect. And uh, there's sleep, but who cares about sleep? But starting in epic, and especially into legendary, these effects can be very, very difficult in magnitude. Stuns last longer, freezes last longer, slows are more slow, and that's very annoying for me. So I typically like to prioritize these tertiaries quite a bit. If I'm not playing Defense Mastery, take an extra consideration towards using Ajax. Take an extra consideration towards using the new Oponas for your boots, especially if you're a summoner. Primal Magma, you know, even if you're a strength scaling class, if you don't have any other freeze res, just note that Act 5 has a lot more freeze effects. And of course, Demon's Blood. Demon's Blood will be a staple of every single build in the game. Um, and it provides some base immunity towards stun, and of course a completion bonus can make you even better that way. And the second shout out is for vitality damage. Vitality damage is a very unique damage type in this game, which makes vitality resist very unique. So anything that does percent total damage to you, percent health and damage, that effect is actually mitigated by vitality resist. And by the way, bosses have a very high non-mitigatable resistance towards that effect, so if you find a throwing weapon that has a 20% chance to apply 150% health and damage, the reason it's 150 isn't to be redundant, it's because a lot of enemies, including heroes and bosses, have very high damage resistance towards that type of ability. It's not just in vitality, it's built in. And of course that works on you too. You'll encounter that sort of damage very frequently throughout the game. It's much more than you would expect. 
So a lot of bosses do it, for instance. So having a high vitality resist is important throughout most of the game, even if it seems like you're not taking lots of bit damage. It also affects life leech. Most notably, Typhon is the very classic, you know, you need demon's blood for Typhon, you want 80% bit res for Typhon. Because when he uses that life leech ability to heal himself, not only is the damage reduced by having a high vitality resist, but the healing he receives from it is reduced as well because your life leech reduction resistance is higher. So fifth on the list is percent damage absorption. This will be a pretty quick one because it's a pretty simple stat. Uh, but it's not to be confused with percent armor absorption, percent increased armor absorption. This just takes the total damage that you're taking at this point in the damage order and multiplies it by 1 minus your total percent damage absorption percentage over 100. Which means if you have a 30% damage absorption, say, or let's go with Colossus. So Colossus gives, I think, 50%. If you have Colossus up, you take the total damage you receive up to this point and multiply it by 0.5. It's just straight multiplication. It's hugely, hugely impactful. And what makes it so good is it takes up all damage, total damage, every single damage category, fire, fizz, pierce, doesn't matter. Sometimes there is a stipulation. If you see listed particular damage types, it means you're only absorbing those damage types. I think that applies for fire shield and ice shield. I can't remember their actual names, but in earth and storm mastery. So this effect can't be reduced, unlike resistances, which is important to know. It's mostly important to know for the offensive video. I'll be making that a little bit later. But it's good to know here too, since of course resists can be reduced. Percent damage absorption cannot be. And of course it would be better if this effect was above armor on the damage order, as we mentioned before. But it's still okay down here. Really, all you really need to worry about in a damage order is that the flat absorption effects, that is like the straight minus 100 damage sort of things, are below the percentage damage mitigations. So you want those percentage multipliers to take an effect first before you get to your flat damage absorption. So that's what makes, like if you see shields, shield absorption, like I think Grim Dawn recently made a change with Ashes of Malmoth, whenever that expansion came out actually, where they put shields towards the top of the damage order. I don't know if that was just a misprint or what, but if that's actually true, it means shields are completely neutered. I mean completely neutered, it's not an exaggeration. But that's not the case here in Titan Quest. In Titan Quest, you're flat absorb, which we'll talk about next. And of course, your life and your shield, those all take an effect after percent absorb and a lot of the other percentage modifiers we've already talked about, like resists and even armor. Armor is technically percentage-based mitigation since armor absorption is the thing working for you. The armor rating is simply the range in which that armor absorption can work. All right, six on the list is flat absorption. Now there's two types of flat absorption, and by the way, this is the verbiage you'll see on energy armor, overgrowth, scroll of elemental shielding, scroll of primal chaos. That's what I mean by flat absorb, right? It just says straight up you absorb X damage, not X percent damage, just X damage. So there's two types of this effect, one that expires on duration and one that expires on damage. And it's the same way in Grim Dawn. There's no distinction between these two in verbiage, but in general, if the absorption has a duration, that means it's probably the kind that expires on duration. So if it has duration, in other words, you'll absorb that full damage that's listed, that X damage, on every single hit for as long as that duration lasts. However, if it doesn't have a duration tied to it, it's probably just some flat piece of, in this case, effective health, since it comes after our resists, that expires once the enemies have hit you up to that. It just pops. Pop goes the bubble. That's the way energy armor works. That's the way overgrowth works as well. They don't have a duration tied to them, so they just break once that damage threshold is breached. This rule may not apply all of the time, such as with scroll of elemental shielding. That scroll has a very high absorption amount, and it also has a duration tied to it. In such a case, I would add that higher numbers likely break on damage rather than duration. So that's something that I assume will break on damage, but will also expire if it hasn't broken by that duration amount. And if you're coming from Grindon, this is the same distinction as Turtle Shell versus Blast Shield or Inquisitor's Seal. 
And like we said before, since flat absorb is beneath percentage absorption and resistances, it can be very effective. So because it's beneath your percent absorption and your resists, you can treat this as effective health. If your flat absorption effects were above all your resists and your percent reductions, then you couldn't treat it as effective health. If, if Turtle Shell and Grim Dawn was at the top of the damage order, it would be almost useless. It's not going to prevent you from dying. But if it's at the bottom of the damage order, it's very, very good. And that's what we have in Titan Quest for its flat absorb mechanics. They're not all too common. Uh, I'd say my favorite one is probably, to be honest, the Scroll of Primal Chaos, because that is also doubles as a great damage scroll. I don't have the highest opinion of energy armor. Um, I suppose I could talk about that here rather than in the offensive video, but it's just because it's so hard to maintain, and especially if you reduce the cooldown if you want to have high uptime. How are you going to get past that 700 energy cost? It's just a ludicrous cost for that ability. So in order to make good use out of it, you'd have to stack both minus recharge and minus energy cost, which is just a huge investment. But if you can get it to work for you, it might be good. You also need cast speed, by the way, because you don't want to whiff it if you're trying to run away and stutter step and cast it while you're stutter stepping. Cast speed definitely comes into effect there. Overall, this is a nice, fluffy, superfluous thing that you might get incidentally. It's not something you would focus your character around in this game. There's just not enough of these effects. But they do exist, and you can make use of them. Hopefully your stupid pet will target you with overgrowth rather than herself or a wolf or something like that. AI tends to... Yeah, I don't like overgrowth. <laughs> and the last thing I want to mention about flat absorb... More often than percent damage absorption, this will be tied to specific damage types. So usually you'll see under the absorption amount that it resists physical, physical and pierce, physical pierce bleed, or maybe that it resists everything. It'll say all, like in the Primal Chaos Scroll. I'd say in general you want your expire on duration effects, so that's the lower number absorb everything for the whole duration. You want those to absorb everything, obviously. But your expire on damage, the ones that break after the threshold is reached, sometimes it is better to have a more constricted damage type affected by that shield. So like Fizz Pierce, for instance. It's up to you, really, but that's something you can look into, especially in Grim Dawn, where this is more prevalent. Uh, there's just not a lot of options here for Titan Quest, but who knows, we might get more in the future. So now we get to shields. Shields is number seven, just beneath flat absorb on the damage order. And it's probably the most complex. I think that this will be the longest section of the video. So I'm going to assume that old information from Vol of Mira's guide on Steam is still applicable. And I assume that guy is either a data miner or a dev. Because, uh, well, if he's not, I would be very, very interested to see how he tested and got the formulas he did. But just note that the majority of what I have to say about shields, I have tested myself. But the exact way they work mechanically, and by the way, you can't find how they work exactly in Grim Dawn. That's why I'm not sure if it works this way or not. This is something you have to get from a developer or a data miner. And you'll see what I mean in a bit. So let's go over just the broad concepts first. First, let me say that shields have become more viable with Ragnarok than they were in Anniversary or Immortal Throne. And that's just due to better itemization. You have more options, especially in Act 5. There's two very good monster and frequent shields that you can farm. You can tailor those affixes. You have no problem stacking uh, shield block. You have more options for stacking shield recovery now more than ever, especially with the new Rune Master. So the potential to use shields as a mode of defense has gone up much greater. So you'll notice if you played Anniversary and looked at the patch notes there, the change log that there's a cap now on shield recovery it's 90 percent that probably wasn't in the anniversary notes actually but that was a change hidden or otherwise in anniversary edition you no longer can have 100 percent block recovery which is unfortunate uh, but don't let that steer you away from shields by itself so before we get into the complicated stuff let's just look at what a shield looks like there's three stats when you first look percent block chance x damage blocked and the physical damage properties of the shield now we're going to ignore that last thing but just note that these all tend to increase proportional to one another and you want to keep them up to date if you intend on using shields as a reliable mode of defense 
it's okay to ignore these stats altogether if you're just using shields for the OP affixes like we talked about Shadow Wall earlier, just to counteract four. This would be applicable if you're, say, a Rune Master who has Rune Word Feather and your strength requirements are much lower. The base shield recovery for shields is somewhere around two and a half to three seconds. So once you've blocked once, your shield goes on cooldown for two and a half to three seconds. Now that cooldown can be reduced by your minus percent shield recharge mod. And that's granted through things like quick recovery. It's granted through turtle shell, the charm. It's granted through rune word absorb and other things like that. And again, it caps at 90%. It's a very important defensive stat with shields. As without it, you can only block, like I said, uh, once every two and a half to three seconds, which gets eaten up probably by some stupid crab or something, you know, Murphy's Law. But with it, if you have 90% shield recovery, you can block three or four attacks per second, which is pretty good. It's not 100%, but it's close enough. I think that distinction is fairly minor. Uh, you have to have like a million creatures attacking you for that to matter, really. And if you do, then you probably weren't in much danger to begin with because you're probably hurting those altogether and AoEing them down to farm them or something. So in general, I'd say a 90% shield recovery cap is fine. So here's where it gets weird with shields in this game. And again, I hope it doesn't work this way in Grim Dawn because it's very weird. So when you take damage to your shield and you block, that damage is either mitigated by a damage equal to your block value, your, you know, that X damage blocked stat on your shield, or it's not mitigated at all, zero. And since this part is almost impossible to test without data mining or dev knowledge, again, I'm assuming that Val of Mira's Steam information is still relevant. But don't worry, regardless of the actual mechanics, the deep mechanics, I'll let you know later on how to use shields in practice. But back to the theory, basically melee or ranged hits lower than the shield block amount, which again, consider this is the end of the damage order, you will block it in full. But if the damage you receive is above your shield block amount, then you block none at all. If that seems bad, well, it's a little bit better than that because all damage segments of a hit are counted separately against your shield absorb amount. So you might not block 150 physical damage if you have 100 damage blocked on your shield. Since 150 is greater than 100, you don't mitigate 100 of that and the end result is 50. No, you mitigate none of it. Like I said, it's a very weird mechanic. So again, you might not block 150 physical damage, but if that hit were instead 50 fizz, 50 pierce, and 50 fire, that's still 150 damage, but since it's segmented three times, then you'll block all of that damage because each instance, each segment of that attack is less than 100, which is your damage blocked on your shield. And most TQ damage is like this, by the way. It's very rare that you just get hit for 150 physical damage. Most of the time you're being attacked by a weapon. That weapon has a pierce ratio. Pierce ratio does not add pierce damage to the top. The same way it works for monsters as it works for you. It simply converts a fraction of that weapon's damage to pierce damage. Also, you can block damage over time, too, so if an attack applies a dot, then the dot damage per second is what is compared to your shield. So if I were to bring all of this stuff into an example, and this example was also given by Val of Mira on his guide, is that, let's say your shield blocks 75 damage, and you receive a single hit, that is 50 fire damage, 80 physical damage, 50 pierce damage, and 150 poison damage over 3 seconds that poison damage applied by the hit. So when you block this hit, the result will be that you take no fire damage because the 75 damage absorbed on your shield is greater than the 50 you received from the hit. You're gonna, re you're gonna take full physical damage because 75 is less than the 80 physical you received. So no fire, full fizz. You're gonna take no pierce since again, the 75 damage absorption on your shield is greater than the 50 pierce damage you received and you're not going to take any poison damage either because again it averages the poison damage over its duration which is 50 damage per second and since 50 damage is less than 75 then you don't take any poison damage and it works that way because every instance of a damage over time every tick is not considered its own attack 
So for dots, shields are pretty good. So the total result of the damage you take from that hit will be 80 damage. And not just 80 damage, but 80 physical damage. It's that full physical damage you received because it was larger than your shield. Normally the amount of damage you're taking is much higher than you'll see on your damage absorption on shields. So again, just like armor, shields aren't great at mitigating gigantic hits. They're better at mitigating small to moderate amounts of damage. And here's the final bit of theory, and this is also very strange. Ranged block is increased as a function of your dexterity. I'm not going to go over the formula. You can find that online. Again, it's a little highbrow for this video, and it's distracting. But this is a hidden mechanic. It's, it's not deflection. It's not projectile dodge. It's something separate. And this is what explains why if you've done testing where you have 75% block, I saw someone on a forum somewhere who was questioning why he had this mechanic going wrong for him. But he was naked or something. He had 75% block. And every projectile that was hitting him was getting blocked. So he said, well, if my block isn't 100%, why am I not getting hit by literally any of these projectiles? It's very likely, and I don't know for sure what his exact issue was, but it's very likely that his dexterity was compensating. So he might have had 75% block if he adds up all of his bonuses on his shield and his gear and stuff. But your dexterity, in a hidden way, sort of modifies the rest of this. Likewise, melee block is increased by a function of your DA versus the OA. So in other words, if your DA is very high compared to your attacker's OA, and again, this only accounts for melee attacks, because ranged and spells aren't affected by this equation at all. If you have that much higher DA, then you'll get a better bonus towards your melee block. Now, in terms of min-maxing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you should go look up those formulas and determine what block you should sit at based on your dexterity and your, you know, assumed defensive ability and then min-max from there, keep your blo block uncapped or something like that. One, DA versus OA is a very volatile thing. So you can't really reliably boost your block based on what you assume your DA is going to be versus everything you're fighting. It can get reduced. So I wouldn't obsess over the min-maxing, but what I would say in practice is that if you have 90% block, you're looking at your gear and you're like, man, I can get it capped, but it's going to take a lot. It just means you don't have to obsess over it. 90% is okay. For the most part, 90%, in addition to your hopefully decent DA, will give you a 100% block chance against melee. And it's very likely your decks will make up the range component of that as well. So that's all the theory. So in practice, I would say it's shields as a defensive mechanic are only worth it if you go all in. That means you can't get too attached to a shield that's providing you skills or something like that or all these awesome stats. If you're relying on shields defensively or offensively, it's much better to make sure you're getting the best version of a shield you can get by that point in the game. So some items that I recommend farming, since this is a guide updated for Ragnarok, I'll mention Act 5. Now Act 5 is going to be where I farm my shields from now on. There's two really good ones. One drops from the Ichthians past Scandia, and it's called the Ichthian Shell Shield. And its native properties are decent, you know, but what's good about it is since it drops from Act 5, it's going to have the highest potential stats for a shield in the game, the native stats. And the second shield is the Enhenyar's Stand Shield. You farm this. It's the same place where you find the Valkyries before Wodan. Uh, I believe it's in Asgard. And this shield is also a very good option, also has very good stats. If you look at both of them, either on screen or in the database, you'll see that their stats are very relatable. And if you compare the legendary versions of both of these shields against the best legendary shields in the game, you'll notice that their shield properties, the native properties, are actually very comparable. And what's nice about these being monster in frequency is that you can tailor the prefix and suffix for what you want. You go for the Enhenyar's stand if you really need more shield recovery, which might be the case in the earlier parts of the game. But I think the Ichthian Shell Shield would be the best endgame shield if it was well rolled. In terms of your charms, you can put a spiny shell on any of these shields if you are using your shield offensively. That's definitely my recommendation. Or otherwise, you can just use a rigid carapace if you have pierced needs 
or if you're using an Enhenyars because you really want the extra block and recovery on normal mode where they're pretty rare, then you can use a turtle shell instead, which gives you some extra block and you can roll that pierce as a completion bonus. That would be pretty good. And the last thing I want to show here is this really, really nice example of an Enhenyar stand shield. And if you look at the stats, it's very interesting because the requirement to equip this thing is level 15. And this has the best shield stats of any shield you're going to find in the entire normal difficulty. You can equip this somewhere in the middle of Act 1, or towards the end of Act 1. And this thing is going to be extremely overpowered at that point in the game. So hopefully that shows off the power of these new shield affixes and gives you some ideas of where you can farm and keep your shields up to date, whether you want to use it for offensive purposes or defensive purposes. Again, the best thing you can do is to look at those base stats and make sure they're the highest, and really prioritize those and not get too attached to the affixes and the stats on an item. All right, so if you've stuck around this long, we're about to get philosophical. Let's talk about life. Life is eighth on the damage order. It's at the very bottom, of course. I mean, once you've bypassed all your resists and all of your absorbs and all that stuff, any damage taken after that is going straight to your life. One thing about life in Titan Quest is that you don't obsess over how much you have as much as you do in other games. That includes Grim Dawn. And that's mostly because there's not a whole lot of ways to recover your life in a percentage sort of way. The vast majority of life increasing you'll do in this game is either leech or potions. And potions incidentally do have percentage health increase, but not all of it. However, you're still going to find overpowered effects like Heart of Oak in the game. That's a buff that gives you like plus 65% of your health or something. It's ridiculous, you know. Uh, in general, I would just shoot for about 1,500 to 2,000 by normal Babylon, which is your first difficulty plateau in the game. I'd shoot for 5,000 by the end of Epic or so, and maybe up to 7,000 by the end game. So you don't have to completely obsess over it, but you will have to dedicate some attributes and some stats to health. My favorite way of getting health is by Dionysus Wineskin, which I have equipped on my rings for the most part and then scaling health lightly through Ajax relics, so that's helpful. In addition, you get 40 health every time you put an attribute point into health. Unfortunately, in Titan Quest, there's no attribute like Physique. I mean, once you play Titan Quest, you'll realize how powerful Physique is, if you didn't know already. Of course, if you're coming from Grim Dawn, it's likely that you just put everything in Physique, or at least, you know, 75% of everything. But anyway, if you have any more than those thresholds I mentioned earlier, it's going to come with opportunity cost, right? And it's not great for recovery. So the, op the opportunity cost might bite you in the end. It might be better to shore up on your resists a little more. You know, resists are usually in prefix while health is in suffix, so you can get both of them. But you don't want to over-sacrifice. You don't want to get, like, a ring if you happen to find a ring and it gives 11% health and 20% strength, you don't want to wear that because you're sacrificing all of the resists you could get otherwise. So let's talk about recovery then. The first and probably most common way you'll recover your life is through your potion. The worst potion in the game, the very basic one, restores 15% of your basic health plus 250 health over time. And as you go up, the better potions in the game, or maybe the best nowadays, gives 35% of your base health instantly, and then 36 health over time. And it's probably the only form of healing based on a percentage of your max HP in the game. The second form of life recovery is life regen. Now, I mentioned this in my normal mode walkthrough for Act 1 on the campaign, but recovery as a... Yeah, I think of recovery as a suffix. Recovery gear is mostly important in Act 1. As, as, as powerful as those stats are ever going to be, but after that, it really becomes, mm, it's not really worth it, unless you go all in. And I would argue even if you go all in, which by the way comes at enormous opportunity cost, I would argue that still isn't going to save your life. The anecdote from Grim Dawn is that you would need thousands of health per second, thousands of health per second in life regen, to even come close to it being something that could save your life. And that's very hard to obtain. Mostly that health is, that you're recovering is 
not health that would otherwise kill you. It's something that could counteract a dot, which is nice. You know, it could it could get rid of those situations of false sense of security, but in most of the time you're dying to spike damage. But anyway, if you do want to go all in on it, your best bet if you're a melee character is to be a Templar. And that's because you can stack Trance of Covalescence with Rally and Adrenaline, and you stack those things with Viney Growth, you could potentially get a high flat and a high enough percentage modifier, like, I don't know, let's say 50 flat health per second, just in flat, and then a modifier of plus four or 500, you can get a few hundred health per second. I, st uh, I don't know if that's enough, but if you want to keep the dream alive and you're not a melee guy, you're not going to play a Templar, one interesting build idea would be Nature Dream. That way you can stack the flat from Trance and the, the flat from Sanctuary, which is a, an upgrade to Briar Ward, along with, uh, of course, percentage scaling. That would give you probably the most potential for your flat. So that would be a pretty interesting one because you could, you know, if you're a pet character, you could go Wolves and Mastermind, and you can sort of tank for your pets by just running into the pack and casting Briar Ward. And you get a lot of regen to help you against incidental AoE damage and magical damage, things like that. And your Briar Ward and yourself could tank for your wolves. Nature Dream might be viable if you want to go for a regen build. And lastly, of course, we have Life Leech. Now there's two types of Life Leech. We'll talk about the X Life Leech over Y Seconds mod first. So that's usually found together in the same affix, usually on green items. I think it comes from the green, green item affix pool. That effect comes together with plus X percent life leech. And the percentage modifier modifies the base over time of the life leech. This is the worst form of life leech, by the way. Uh, it's, it's bad because the amount of life you leech with the base effect is pretty low. It's like 39 life leeched over 3 seconds or something like that. That's pretty lackluster when you consider by the time you find that affix, you probably have a couple thousand health. So that's not so good, right? Even with the scaling on plus percent life leached, uh, it's not going to be great. However, like I said before, life leached is dictated by vitality resistance. So if you can manage to reduce your enemy's vitality resistance, you can make them slightly more susceptible to this leech effect. It's still not going to be great just because the base is just too low. That's, that's frankly all there is to it. But some of the new items in the game with Ragnarok do come with a re-evaluated form of life leech. That seems to be good. So conceivably you can make a build, but you'd be very dependent on that particular itemization. Also note that while you can reduce vitality res, you cannot reduce monsters innate resistance towards life and energy leech effects, which you can read on the anniversary edition change log. So that also limits the potential, especially versus bosses. But the redeeming quality of this form of leech is that since it's a dot, you can apply it to multiple targets at once and you'll benefit from all of them at once. Usually this dot is limited to three seconds though, so your potential there is, you know, it's based on your attack speed and it's still not great, I would argue. But in the early game, you can make use of this, especially with your regen to multi-dot targets, kind of finish them off and get extra leech for yourself. And then we come to attack damage converted to health. Now this is the classically accepted version of leech in modern RPGs, ever since Diablo 2 really, but it's the leech you want for Diablo 2, it's the leech you want for Grim Dawn, it's the leech you want for Path of Exile, though they have different mechanics there. But this is the kind that's based on the damage you deal. Now it only works on attacks, including ranged attacks. It does work with throwing weapons. And by the way, you can leech with physical damage. You can leech with pierce damage. You can leech with elemental damage. But it does not work on spells and it does not work on dots, even if it was an attack, a ranged or melee attack, that applied the dot. Another thing is that this leech applies post-mitigation. So it's your post-mitigation damage that you apply to the enemy that then gets converted to health for yourself. It's not your you know, unmitigated damage, that would be a little overpowered. But just note off of that, that damage in Titan Quest is relatively low, the damage you deal. So this isn't broken absurd like in Grim Dawn or PoE where your damage is in the, you know, hundreds of thousands in Grim Dawn or the millions in PoE. So relative to your health, your own health, the damage you're dealing is fairly tame. It's, it's still very good at topping off. I mean, my, 
Dragon Hunter as of the recording of this video on, on my live stream. I'm in uh, Legendary. And my damage is good enough to where I'm leeching a very, very solid amount per second. It's so noticeable that when I fight undead, I'm constantly chugging potions, whereas if I'm fighting anything else, I pretty much just rely on my leech, and I don't chug potions at all, just in emergency situations. And by the way, you cannot leech life from undead, so there you go. So another good thing about this form of leech is you're not affected as much by the whims of vitality, at least not vitality alone. For instance, if you get to reduce your enemy's resistances, you kind of double dip from that effect. One, because you're dealing more damage with whatever damage you're dealing because their mitigation is lower and also because they're less resistant to leech in general so whereas you can't bypass that unreducible resistance towards life leech you can reduce their overall resistance towards damage and then you deal more damage ergo you leech more and generally i'd say 8 to 16 percent attack damage converted to health is good enough any more again comes with opportunity costs so you can find the full 16% in a single weapon. You can find 8% in a single weapon. If you do it in two weapons, that's just two affixes that you're using for this stat. That's pretty good. And Ragnarok itemization is, seems to be pretty good for this effect, especially in throwing weapons. I find more weapons on average in the vendor and on the ground with high amounts of leech than I remember in Immortal Throne or even Anniversary Edition. So that's the conclusion of the damage order. Again, when you take any piece of damage, you have to step through this one by one, all the way from the top to the bottom, which is life, before that damage is applied to your health bar. Now I'm going to talk about some other notable defensive ideas. These are things that you should be aware of in general in Titan Quest. And I'll also talk about a few mechanical tips, just ways you can control your character to increase your odds of survival. So in terms of the notable defensive ideas, I'll go pretty quick fire. But first is shotgunning. Now shotgunning in this game is very interesting because you can use it offensively. Now that's a very legacy idea. Modern ARPGs have gotten rid of that completely because it's frankly overpowered. You cannot balance a game when you have shotgunning as an offensive mechanic, but it exists in Titan Quest, so draw your own conclusion from that. But you can also be shotgun. That still exists in many games. And by the way, shotgunning, I guess I should be a little bit less highbrow. You're going to run into this often enough in every single ARPG, this word, that I'll go ahead and define it. What shotgunning means is that a single attack will have multiple projectiles. So think of like multi-shot, the classic multi-shot. You fire one attack and it spreads arrows across the screen. If every single one of those projectiles and that single attack can hit a single target, that's what's called shotgunning. So to take the example of multi-shot, that's a cone attack, and the cone starts at the center of your character's hitbox, and it fans out. And if you can get hit by every single one of those close projectiles, that's shotgunning. And it's called shotgunning because you're very close, and there's tons of little pellets that are hitting you at once. So you can immediately see why taking all those projectile damages in full is extremely powerful. I mean, if you're using ice shards, you've probably noticed while killing some chunky boss that every single one of your shards is hitting, and the boss just gets deleted from the face of the planet. Well, that's by design, uh, and it's also by design with the monsters, so just be wary of that. It mostly comes in form of cold damage and pierce damage. That suspicious-looking flower in Medea's Grove has actually killed one of my characters before. Next is pets. I said earlier that pets are a great way of avoiding spike damage. Really, they just lower the likelihood that you're going to take lethal damage. It doesn't get rid of that statistic whatsoever, but you'll find yourself in less critical situations when you have pets with you. Pets are extremely important in Titan Quest uh, for mitigating damage, but only if you can get them to survive. Luckily, Ragnarok has added some itemization. Many of the items in the game that provide pet bonuses uh, with Anniversary Edition also grant health to your pets in addition to damage, also some resists. You can buff most of your pets with conventional buffs, either targeted buffs or AoE buffs. So there's a lot of ways to make your pets more durable, but because of those mechanics, I have to assume that it was balanced, right? So you kind of need them, in other words. So it's sometimes a little bit difficult to say, man, I'm getting killed by Manticore. I better respec into, I don't know, Magma Golem guy 
so that way he can tank for me. It might actually help you. It might be enough. But the opportunity cost of that, unless you're going to cheese the game and respec summon the pet spec back, you know, something like that. The opportunity cost there is, who knows, it might be worse to do that if you don't have anything to buff your pets through items. Pets are in a league of their own here. It's just, let it suffice to say that the more they're tanking for you, the less heat you have, the better your odds are at not enduring a situation that could kill you. That's the best I could say for pets, and I think that's the most accurate thing to say for pets. There's no statistical exact, you know, numbers to go along with it. And also be informed that since Anniversary, there's some new secret bosses. Some of these aren't classified as bosses, but rather heroes like Shadow Maul. But despite that, they're extremely powerful. They'll kill you in one to two hits. Uh, I will show that definitely later. And lastly, some mechanics to help you out. So game knowledge is, is the best thing you can do here. Of course, I have a walkthrough of the campaign on my channel. So knowledge of the campaign is going gonna, is gonna to do you well knowing what's coming up and how to counter it. That's just classic. That's exactly how you beat games, right? So in this video, I'm just going over the concepts, but putting them in practice against the content you're facing, that also requires campaign knowledge. So you're only getting half the picture here, in other words. So if you want the rest revealed, go ahead and watch the campaign walkthrough. If you want to just see it all unfold, then I totally understand that. But if you combine those two things together, it's very infrequent that you will ever die. So a few more mechanical things. LOSing, line of sighting, is very effective in this game, particularly against those pesky archers that we talked about earlier, the Mackay and stuff. You can force them to come to you if you're a melee. You can, you know, disrupt their range projectiles. They won't try to shoot through walls. They'll try to find an angle to hit you. And you can mess with AI by doing that. So a good strategy with LOSing is like you're up against a bunch of archers, but there's a door nearby. So you cast eruption at the door and then you run behind the door and kind of off to the side. They come towards you, but the AI is too dumb to see that there's an eruption there. So they walk right into the eruption and then they, you can kill them from there. You could do the same thing with squall or any other attack, really. So setting up those situations is beneficial. Another mechanical concept is leashing. Leashing is when an enemy stops chasing you. So if you run away from an enemy and they chase you to the ends of the earth, that means they have a long leash. If you run away from a boss or something and they go back to where they started, that means they have a short leash. And leashing is the act of them, you know, disengaging from you and going back to where they came from. So I swear, maybe I'm crazy, but I'm pretty sure they did something with leashing and Ragnarok. So I think there's two things that dictates this. One is that the developers specifically set a certain leash range for a particular mob. Mostly this is bosses. Bosses rarely like to leave their arenas. But also some monsters. I suspect that they manually changed the leash range of Nixies, Water Nixies, in Act 5. Because before the patches, they would follow me to the ends of the earth. They would follow me all the way to Surtur or whatever his name is if they could. They would never, ever, ever leash. But then all of a sudden, after they changed their abilities and stuff, they started leashing pretty easily. And they're pretty fast creatures, so I assume they could keep up with me if they want, but they decide not to. So maybe I'm just crazy there, but the devs definitely have the ability to set leash ranges manually if they want to. The more common leashing principle that dictates what mobs do and, you know, non-boss creatures and the most common type of leashing you're going to encounter is based off of run speed. So basically, mobs, if they can keep up with you, and there's less distance between you and them as they're chasing you, then they might leash eventually. But for the most part, if they can keep up with you, they will not leash. So some monsters are pretty slow, like zombies. You'll have no problem running past zombies and going to fight some boss past them, but you will have a problem with faster creatures. If you're trying to run past them and engage a boss beyond, you'll find that they follow you and they engage you as well as you engaging the boss, and they can cause you trouble that way. So if you're in a farm spot like a fountain farm and you're trying to just attack specific enemies like Gorgons or Valkyries or whatever, those humanoid type of mobs tend to be fairly fast, fast enough at least not to leash. So it's important when you're looking for a grind spot and you're concerned about efficiency to learn the leash range of creatures to feel that out 
Can you run through the Tower of Judgment? You absolutely can. Will those Mackay archers leash before you reach Cerberus? Yes, they will. You know, that's just something I've picked up from playing the game. And that lets me know that I can skip the Tower of Judgment, which is just beautiful because I hate that place. Now on to more mechanical things. Uh, the first concept is stutter stepping. This is another highbrow sort of piece of lingo that people use from ARPG to ARPG. And they also use it for other games too. Stutter stepping is something you can use in RTSs. It's something you can use in MMOs, just random RPGs. But it's definitely a skill you want to develop. The way you use stutter stepping is you utilize the attack in position key. That's a hotkey you can bind in pretty much any game. Any ARPG I've ever played has attack in place key, which includes, I think, Diablo 1. Just go into your hotkeys, you'll see it there. Always bind it to spacebar, because your left thumb is almost always free. It doesn't really matter what the control schemes are in a game. I mean, PoE has its potions on 1 through 5. Other games have abilities on 1 through 5, so the exact schemes with your first four fingers on your left hand, those might be a little bit different from game to game, but your left thumb is almost always free, and you want to be able to use stutter stepping on a whim. You don't want to have any weird bumbles with your fingers. You don't want to trip over your fingers at all. If your first four fingers are utilized, your thumb is not, you'll always be able to stutter step. And how you use it is, is by doing this. First, you engage with a mob or a mob engages with you. You step away from the mob by clicking away from them. As your character is moving in the reverse direction away from the monster, that's when you hit spacebar. Once you've stopped, and hopefully there's enough distance at this point between you and the monster, you move your mouse back over towards the monster and either click on the monster or past the monster, it doesn't really matter, and you attack. So of course I have an example of what that looks like, it's hard to explain it. And the reason it's so good is because your only other option really is to stand there and trade with the boss or the enemy you're fighting, so they're attacking you at their highest attack speed, you're attacking them at your highest attack speed. But wouldn't it be better if you could attack at your highest attack speed, but they couldn't hit you at all? That's where stutter stepping was born, and that's the idea and the ideal with stutter stepping. Now, of course, stutter stepping isn't perfect at dodging every attack from an enemy. It tends to be pretty erratic, you know, you're focusing on that cadence. A better thing to do against a single enemy is something I demonstrated on the first act of my campaign walkthrough. And I called it the boar technique there. Really, it's just a form of stepping away that's specific to single-player offline ARPGs. So in online ARPGs, since there's a server and they have to communicate with the server, usually a hit is resolved at the beginning of an attack animation. So if you're playing PoE and like some big chunky boss swings at you and you see the animation go through, even if you dive away at the last second before his claw comes down or whatever, it's very likely that that hit has been resolved already, and it'll hit you even when you've broken away. That's not the case with Titan Quest. In order for a, a melee hit to be resolved, you have to be in melee range at the end of that animation. That means you can break away when you start to see a boss telegraph their attack. And I'll of course demonstrate what this looks like, and by the way, this is Shadow Maul. So you see what it looks like when you just stand there and attack, so I'm not stutter stepping, I'm not using the boar technique here at all. And you can see he kills me in two hits, that's no good, right? This is where stutter stepping and the boar technique really come into play. So you'll see on this second attempt, it's the same character, the same stats, the same level, everything like that. But this time I implement the boar technique. So what this is, is that every time you see them start to attack, you run away. So it's different from stutter stepping in that I'm not utilizing this constant cadence of attack, run away, attack, run away. Instead, I'm watching the mob, I'm watching the enemy, this single enemy, very closely, and when he starts to attack, I run away, I just back off slowly. And then I start attacking again. So I only back off when he starts to attack, I'm not constantly backing off and shooting. Now, of course, this works very well against a single enemy, and you can see I'm doing this on very fast, with the game sped up, against a fast enemy. So this is like, you know, if you really want to practice, that's the way to do it. But if you're up against multiple enemies, this technique, the boar technique, is not so good because you can't watch everyone's animation and they're going to be at attacking at different, you know, timers. One of them is going to attack at t equals 0, one of them is going to attack at t equals 0 0.3, and it's just going to be impossible for you to dodge every attack. So that's where stutter stepping starts to come in. 
for now, I would just practice both of those skills individually. If you make a new character and you're fighting a boar, it's just a boar, practice that boar technique. If you're up against a lot of enemies in particular, like those dragon can that charge you with the spears before Typhon, stutter stepping is extremely effective against those because you're going to dodge some of their attacks, not all of their attacks, but like 50, 60%. I mean, let me put it to you this way. How feasible is it that you're going to get 60% physical resistance by that part in the game? Pretty freaking unfeasible. So if you can instead just dodge 60% of their attacks, that's even better than Fizz Res. But you can see why trying to dodge attacks altogether mechanically uh, just puts an enormous amount of tools into your arsenal. So thanks for sticking around if you've been around this long. I'm going to be coming out with an offensive-oriented video. There's a lot of concepts to talk about for offense. I do feel like defense is the more important topic in this game, but being able to talk about and optimize your offense, that just means you can put more of that focus and more of those affixes and more of that dedication into worrying about your defense, and your character will be better off for it. Of course, there's going to always be a balance between offense and defense. Some characters are better offensively than they are defensively. So you can look for that in a couple of weeks. It takes time. I have to write a script, and then I have to record footage, and then I have to do a post commentary, and then I have to, you know, edit all the footage together with all the different video segments. So in the meantime, you can come find me on Twitch. I stream under twitch.tv slash clex231, C-L-E-X-231. So drop by, ask a question, or just hang out. If you're a YouTube guy, I plan to do build guides. So the first one will be for the Dragon Hunter. And of course, I'll do an offensive mechanics guide, and I have three, four, maybe five more build guides. So come stop by. It's helpful since I'm just starting out, and thanks for watching.